Authorities in southern Lebanon are accusing Israel of killing five health workers and its strikes on the town of Dedegaya. According to their tally, this brings the total number of health workers killed to at least 115 since the beginning of Israel's operation in Lebanon last month. According to the Lebanese Defense Forces, the health workers were waiting in a makeshift emergency response center and a church hall when the blast occurred. Authorities are searching the debris for more victims. Also, two overnight airstrikes were reported in the Hezbollah-controlled Beirut neighborhood of Dahie, with Israel claiming it targeted terrorist infrastructure. And the Israeli army has released this video showing what the army says are strikes followed by explosions of Hezbollah weapons storage facilities in Lebanon, ground clashes between Israeli forces and Hezbollah, which is backed by Iran, have spread along southern Lebanon's mountainous frontier as the Middle East is on high alert awaiting Israel's response to an Iranian missile strike last week. U.S. President Joe Biden and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu spoke over the phone on Wednesday about a potential Israeli retaliation against Iran and a call both sides have described as positive. Let's bring in the VOA's Jacob Russell. He is in Beirut. Jacob, great to see you. What are the Israeli airstrikes, or where are the Israeli airstrikes targeted in Lebanon now? So the airstrikes have intensified quite a lot in the past week. They are mostly concentrated around the south of the country. Um, the closer you get to the border, obviously, the more intense the airstrikes uh, become. Uh, they're not uh, exclusively in that area, though. They are also targeting certain neighborhoods in, in Beirut, the Dahya, as you, as you mentioned in your introduction, um, and also all up the Bekaa Valley um, in the east of the country. Um, and then there are also uh, sporadic airstrikes in areas um, which, which are not normally being targeted, if you see what I mean. Is there any fear that Lebanon could be caught up in the impending crossfire between Israel and Iran? Um, Israel yet to announce its uh, proposed targets or attacks on Iranian sites following those airstrikes that landed in Israel last week. Absolutely. I mean, the relationship between Hezbollah and Iran ties the fate of Lebanon to that of Iran uh, quite inextricably at the moment. So there's a, a lot of fear, there's a lot of tension, there's a lot of nervousness waiting to see what uh, Israel will do, how it will retaliate. While that remains to be seen, of course, those fears are somewhat shapeless because uh, it simply no, nobody really knows what is going to happen and how then Iran will, will retaliate that. But there is this sense uh, in Lebanon of being um, stuck in this uh, kind of somewhat hopeless loop of retaliation between these two powers. I'm looking at the video now on air um, of the, um, is the one released by the Israeli um, forces about the airstrikes mm. in, uh, his, in Lebanon today. And I'm just wondering, you know, if there are civilians in some of these buildings. I know that there have been evacuation orders over the past few mm. days for people to leave but is it possible that there's some people who have remained, have stayed behind, and have possibly died in some of these airstrikes? Absolutely, absolutely. There are still people in the south of Lebanon. There are people who have remained behind to protect their property. There are people who have remained because they can't leave. They don't have anywhere to go. 1.2 million people have been displaced inside Lebanon. Um, and Lebanon was already a densely populated country. So those 1.2 million people simply don't have places to go. You know, the country is, is uh, the northern half of the country is saturated with displaced people. So there are people who have stayed because they don't see a better option. And there are deaths every day from these airstrikes, civilian deaths every day from these airstrikes. So certainly, although the south of the country has been um, greatly depopulated, of course, that 1.2 million people came from somewhere, there are still people remaining there, civilians. And what is the condition in Beirut where you are? Because we do understand so many people uh, left and headed towards, you know, the capital, Beirut, have taken um, sh uh, temporary shelters there. Uh, in just a few months, uh, the weather will change. It will become cooler, uh, you know, um, as the winter season begins. 
what is it like for people who are seeing these ones who are just, um, you know, making the most of their, what they call their lives now? Mm -hmm. It's extremely difficult. And of course, you know, all of those people who have been displaced, they come from all kind of socioeconomic um, uh, str uh, strata of society. So you have people who have perhaps uh, uh, have money, have relatives uh, in other parts of the country. They can afford to rent an apartment somewhere else and they can move into, you know, relatively, although their experience is, is still horrendous, relatively comfortable circumstances. And then, of course, you have all the way down to people who really were already struggling. You know, so you do see now on the streets of Beirut, you see people sleeping on the street, you see people sleeping on beaches, uh, you see people sleeping in, in public squares. Um, the government is not offering uh, support to these people. And in fact, uh, you have security forces intermittently moving them on from places, even though there's nowhere really for them to move on to. Uh, and what you have is civil society stepping in to fill the gap where the state should be. So you have a lot of volunteer organizations um, taking in donations, whether that's uh, uh, financial or donations in kind, and then distributing that amongst these people. Talk to us, uh, Jacob, about UN positions, the set of come under fire by Israeli forces. Why would the peacekeepers be of any interest to the IDF? Mm. Well, Israel has a very antagonistic relationship with the UN at the moment. They recently declared uh, Antonio Gutierrez a persona non grata inside Israel. Um, they have uh, is Israeli, the IDF, uh, soldiers from the IDF that have uh, uh, made their way into Lebanon have set up positions, in some cases directly adjacent to UN positions. The UN then complained about this because, of course, that draws fire onto, uh, that draws crossfire onto UN positions. Um, and Israel responded by asking them to leave those positions. Um, if you look at the uh, fire that has been directed at UN positions from IDF forces, it's very hard to say that this is accidental fire. You know, it's targeted at uh, observation cameras. Um, yesterday, there was a, a tank fired at an observation tower that had two UN soldiers in it, and they're still in hospital, having then fallen from that tower as it collapsed. Uh, in one case, a UN position was being fired on, and a small um, Israeli drone flew into the position, flew up to the uh, entrance of the bunker where the UN forces were were um, were sheltering. So it, it, it's it's very hard to say that this is accidental fire. And if you look at the things that are being targeted, you could argue that there is some symbolic message in that. They're targeting cameras, they're targeting observation towers, they are targeting the ability of the UN to observe the conflict. Pretty interesting. Thanks for bringing that up. And how is the health system holding up in Lebanon? How are they operating <clears throat> under these circumstances? Um, Lebanon's health system is uh, struggling, is the short answer. Um, it's remarkably resilient, given the circumstances that it's operated in for the last few years and now. Um, as you mentioned, uh, these strikes on, um, on rescue workers um, uh, the number, the official number that you mentioned, I think it was 115 rescue workers that have been killed in, in the past yes. year. Most of those have been killed in the past month. Um, and uh, there's uh, hundreds of uh, ambulances have been destroyed. Um, there's currently four hospitals in the south that have been put out of action, either by direct strikes or so many strikes around the hospital that it no longer became feasible for anybody to access the hospital. Um, and the civil defense uh, forces, which is the state uh, rescue service, uh, as or coming under fire, as well as rescue services that are affiliated with Hezbollah or affiliated with other political movements in the country. Um, and although those uh, those those workers are continuing to do their to do their job, you know you do have. Uh, you do have members of those services now saying that they feel like they're on suicide missions. They feel like uh, every time they go out to a strike or even just to a regular fire that's been caused by an electrical fault or something, uh, they really feel like they are liable to be um, hit by an airstrike at any moment. I realize we've never really talked about the power situation in Lebanon. What, it has, been, what has that been like since the Israeli airstrikes? You mean electrical power? Yes. 
Um, so prior to um, this war, prior to October 7th last year, the, the, the state electricity system had, had uh, more or less collapsed under the influence of the economic crisis, and it had been replaced by private uh, generator operators. Um, so most people will receive or were receiving about four hours of state power per day, and then the rest of the time, if they could afford it, was made up by subscribing to a generator in the neighborhood. Um, you know, that's where my power comes from, for example. Um, in Beirut, that has been fairly unaffected. Uh, in the south, it has been severely affected, uh, entirely knocked out in some parts. Um, and what you also have at the moment, because of the sheer volume of people who have been displaced and moved into other parts of the country, you have, for example, the internet is slowing down because the um, demand now has been concentrated into, uh, into a smaller area. So at the moment, um, services such as they are, are holding up outside of the south, of course, mm. outside of Dahye, in the places that are being targeted regularly. But you are starting to see uh, cracks appear and strains appear. Right, right, right. Uh, back to, um, you know, those airstrikes, Hezbollah has continued, however, to fire on dozens of uh, rockets into Israel. Uh, clearly, this violates any efforts by Lebanon at achieving a ceasefire. We did hear um, the government official a few days ago talk about this, about Lebanon being ready uh, to discuss a ceasefire. But what have you heard regarding this? And uh, what support Hezbollah really is given to the uh, skeletal Lebanese government uh, that exists in the country uh, uh, regarding a ceasefire? very difficult to say because, uh, frankly, since the death of Nasrallah, uh, Hezbollah's public-facing statements have become few and far between. Uh, they've changed their strategy to one of um, discretion. You know, they realize they've been massively infiltrated, whether that's by uh, human intelligence or signals intelligence. Um, so they have not been uh, making very many public, public statements. Um, they, of course, have to... Um, uh, it, it seems that they are moving towards uh, the, the idea that um, uh, a ceasefire between Hezbollah and Israel could be disconnected from a ceasefire in Gaza, which was always um, uh, the, the, the message that was coming out before, that it was only with a ceasefire in Gaza that there would be a ceasefire in the north. Um, they have to, in the meantime, uh, or they feel they have to uh, keep uh, retaliating to Israeli attacks to maintain what balance of deterrence there is left between the two sides. Well, Jacob, thanks again for speaking with us, and we do appreciate um, the Thank sacrifice you. you're making. Stay safe as much as you can. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night. Uh, Israel's ambassador to the UN, Danny Danon, has told reporters in New York he, what he thinks is solution to ending Israel's offensive in Lebanon, which includes withdrawing to the north of the Litany River, in accordance with the UN Resolution 1701. A UN peacekeeping mission is mandated by Security Council Resolution 1701. It was adopted in 2006 to help the Lebanese army keep its southern border area with Israel free of weapons or armed personnel other than those of the Lebanese state. And that has sparked friction with Iran-backed Hezbollah, which effectively controls southern Lebanon. All parties are banned from crossing the Blue Line, a UN map line separating Lebanon from Israel and the Israeli-occupied Golan Heights. Yet, even as Hezbollah continues their murderous campaign, senior Hezbollah officials have the audacity to demand that Israel cease fire. Let me be clear about that. No one should mistake the arrogance of these terrorists for diplomacy. Hezbollah calls for a ceasefire while simultaneously murdering Israeli civilians with their rockets. If Hezbollah wants the situation to de-escalate, it's very simple. They have to do two things. First, they must immediately stop shelling our civilian communities. Second, Hezbollah must withdraw to the north of the Litani River in accordance with UN Resolution 1701, was adopted here in the Security Council in 2006. Until that happens, Israel will continue our operations to degrade Hezbollah's terror network. We found uh, a lot of uh, weapon, weapons uh, in the bunkers next to our border, and we will do whatever it takes to secure our people 
and enable the 70,000 displaced Israelis to return home safely. Meanwhile, the United States thinks Israel needs to urgently address what it calls catastrophic conditions among Palestinian civilians in the besieged Gaza Strip and stop intensifying suffering by limiting aid deliveries. This was put forward by the U.S. Ambassador to the U.N., Linda Thomas-Greenfield. She addressed the recent Israeli order for civilians in Gaza to evacuate again, saying they must be able to return to communities to rebuild. And rebuild. Conditions are catastrophic and will further deteriorate if additional steps are not taken. Indeed, all parties must meet their responsibilities under Resolution 2720. The flow of humanitarian aid through multiple border crossings to Palestinian civilians is desperately needed and must be allowed. Welcome the appointment of Tom Flesher as the new emergency. The United States is concerned by the situation in northern Gaza, including the announcement by Israel of a new evacuation order for several communities. We're particularly concerned that Palestinian civilians have nowhere safe to go. Already there are devastating reports of the squalid conditions in the humanitarian zone in southern and central Gaza, where more than 1.5 million displaced civilians have fled. These catastrophic conditions were predicted months ago and yet have still not been addressed. That must change. And now we call on Israel to take urgent steps to do so. And I reiterate the United States expectation that Palestinian civilians, including those evacuated from the north, be permitted to return to their communities and rebuild. Consistent with Resolution 2735, there must be no demographic or territorial change in the Gaza Strip, including any actions that reduce the territory of Gaza. We are also concerned by recent action by the Israeli government to limit the delivery of goods into Gaza. When combined with new bureaucratic limits, placed on humanitarian goods arriving from Jordan and the closure of most border crossings in recent weeks, these restrictions would only have the effect of intensifying suffering in Gaza. We need to see fewer barriers to the delivery of aid, not more of them.